Pangdendo Good evening. Uh, it's my <laughs> it's my great honor to be with you this evening and uh, to have uh, uh, opportunity to speak with you um, this. Uh, the topic, um, topic, topic is what joy, joyful living, and uh, peaceful dying. <laughs> <laughs> very beautiful. Yes, a very beautiful topic uh, is chosen, and um, <clears throat> now. This is a very informal talk tonight, rather than teaching. And the uh, atmosphere is also different. When you talk in temple and you talk in the public hall, it's a different atmosphere. And also, it's, a, it's a really beautiful. And uh, the topic, the joyful living, and uh, peaceful dying is very, mm, very general. It's nothing special at all. It's nothing special, although it sounds very special and very sweet and very beautiful. But if you are so mindful and if you are able to catch yourself to hold your back, from the wrong trap and the wrong direction, then the beautiful living is there already. It's nothing something special that you really need to go somewhere to search how to live joyfully. This is not the case at all. Our life it is, it itself is so beautiful. And you are living very beautifully enough. Yes. And, uh, but the problem is that you are ignored it. This is a problem. So it still goes back to the same subject that we have been discussed in the past, that is ignorance. Ignorance is the cause of the absence of joyfulness. And the ego is the one who causes the absence of joyfulness. And it is not that someone or somewhere causes this absence of joyfulness, but it's the self, the causing. Because you are failed to catch yourself. And if somebody catch you, that's very impractical. Don't let someone catch you. But you rather catch yourself. Why we are in this samsara, wandering through unnecessary or unwanted situation? so painful, so miserable life that we are going through and as well as all sentient beings. We examined the cause of this and the joyful that you have found in your life 
does not sustain them always. It comes and it goes. And it comes and it goes. Does not stay with you, does not stay within. What makes this? And uh, because this caused by overwhelmed our desire, overwhelmed our attachment, and overwhelmed our the longing that you are so much dissatisfied with what you are having. So our Lord Buddha, from Buddhist point of view, and the teaching of Theravada, the teaching that is purposely formed, performed for the, the practitioners of the Theravada, the satisfaction, satisfaction, satisfaction is this source of joyfulness in the teaching of Theravada. They don't talk about compassion. They don't talk about loving kindness. They don't talk about bodhicitta at all because they regard themselves as not capable to produce or to cultivate those noble qualities. Because the time for us is to be the satisfactory with anything that you have. So in this regard, I myself also feel that we are too much dissatisfactory. Our, our main problem in life, that you want something, okay, have achieved, yet you are very dissatisfied. And then you look for another, and okay, possibly achieved, but very dissatisfactory. So because of the dissatisfaction, and it cause, and then you are too much demand. So all these are cause of the absence of a joyfulness. So that is the very principal teaching in the Theravada tradition. So in, a, in a, our common sense, this is a very practical. If you understand or if you pay attention to this matter, this is very, uh, this is very like, sensible. Like a family or individual the, who is very satisfactory with what they are having, the innermost peace is there. And they are so joyful. They are so joyful. When I look at, like in Himalaya, it's a very clear boundary the, between dissatisfaction and the satisfaction. The, those a rich family, like a millionaire or billionaire whatsoever, when I observe their lives, it's very obvious that you can sense they are really going through a difficult time. Themselves do not have time to enjoy with what they are having. The property, the name, the good car, good house, good family, yet they are very unhappy because dissatisfaction. And they want to do more. And they want to get more money. Never satisfied. So their mind is very restless. Very restless. Now the other one, who does not have that much money, and uh, the family or individual, they are so happy. They're playing around, very sportive, drinking, okay, and a singing song, okay. So when you ask them, how is everything? They say, oh, satisfactory. I have it today, I eat. Tomorrow, I can manage something. I don't need to think of tomorrow, it's okay. Until now, everything seems no problem. I, I did manage. Yesterday was okay. Before yesterday was okay. You see, today, I'm not still okay. 
I, I had my dinner, I had my lunch, I had my breakfast, and I feed my children also, no problem. And tomorrow I don't need to think, let sun arise, then we can do something. You see, deep inside their mind, they have a joyfulness. They are very happy. And then health-wise, they are very healthy. They are very healthy. Yes, some in the eastern part of Bhutan, they don't know what is diabetes. They don't know what is diabetes. And the blood pressure, when we talk about the blood pressure, they say, what is the blood pressure? Because they are so healthy, you see, this self proof already. So someone don't know what is blood pressure, diabetes, which means they are healthy. And they don't need to take a medicine. They are so happy. So you see, so when you observe, you can have found, you can find that these cause just simply dissatisfaction and satisfaction. So all a mental attitude. In this modern world, everything seems okay, developing, financially, economically, seems everything okay, but deep inside, they have a sorrow. The sorrow of a dissatisfaction, computation, challenging, stress, depression, anxiety, a lot of things, one after another. Like when I'm traveling in Hong Kong and Singapore, when I look these people around, they even don't have time to sit down and eat properly, like this, driving and eating. Okay? And sometimes they have maybe 10 minutes eat together with us, but after a few spoons, the phone call said that, sorry, I have to leave. So good food is left behind. You see? So this is very common sense. It's nothing to do with the Buddha's teaching, actually. But the technique given by Buddha says, be satisfied. That makes you calm and peaceful. So therefore, the, as I said earlier, living joyfully or joyful living is rather simple because it's, it's in your hand. It's you, because it, it is in your hand. You don't need to do research how to live joyfully because this is not, nothing special topic or special lesson that you need to be learned for sustaining of your joyful life. It is that something that you can tell yourself if you wake up your mind, and uh, this is very obvious, and you can walk around and uh, talk to them, and you can find. So therefore, living joyful, or joyful living, whatsoever you call, this is something you need to train your mind in the sense of uh, the understanding of the reality. It is uh, something to do with your experience. And every life's children or family, individual, whether you are practitioner or not, or you are religious individual or non-religious individual, or free thinker, whatever background you have really doesn't make difference at all. Our principal aim and our principal intention is a totally equal those who really want to live joyfully. Yes, this is very obvious. And a happy family, you can find like your dad, mom, the kids always smile and the laughing and the playing around, make it fun, yeah? They never talk about position, computation, stress, depression, yeah? You see? And then some family always fighting each other. No peace, no harmony in the family. And the dad and the mom always say arguing, the fighting for no reason. And then it affects children. 
very bad image. So ch children, because of this image, then low quality of caring and the loving, then this effect their own children, then the children lost his or her determination and they lost his her or his direction. And they become almost hopeless. And it's it will affect so deeply. And this this will last always. Then the children cannot find the joy inside the heart. And the memory is always there. When they were child, so they can they can they have been seen what was happened in the family. And it's affected. And the nightmare is still there. And it's affected there the mental peace, mental stability. So maybe the children also become like their own parent. The attitude, mental attitude, no morality, no social sense, no human sense, no humanity. Everything becomes very chaotic. It is the fact. So this is very common sense, right? If you are educated, worldly educated, you can sense that. And everybody is like educated, the professional, the professor, speaker, teacher, lawyer. What, what position you are holding, but if you do not bring it into life, doesn't make sense. Education does not mean that only the name or possession or the reputation. The education means that you need to make a change your mental attitude. You have to give a good example in the society, in the social. Does not mean that you are gaining some the profit. The professor does not mean that you need to write a book, countless numbers. Speaker does not mean that you speak the countless uh, on the hours, speaker or professor or doctor, whatever, your duty is to give a good contribution in this world. You have to make this world beautiful. You can contribute this. That's why education is needed. Otherwise, you use, misuse the education. And then by misusing education, you yourself make it deteriorate your joyfulness also. And you can't find the joyfulness. Where is the joyfulness? Joyful cannot provide by money, by position, by reputation. Joyful does not provide you by the material, materialistic, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, the attitude. Joyfulness only you can find from the mind. If you are capable to change your attitude towards others, for this, changing attitude is also not simple. It's rather difficult because our negative habitual tendency is so profound and so deep and so vast, like an ocean. Because of this, from the beginning list of a time, you know, it's a countless eons and eons. In this single life, if you are uneducated, your behavior is not good, you are, you are absence of the morality, let's say you drink alcohol or you smoke, which is not good, then you see the habitual tendency that you have accumulated for a year, maybe two years, three years. Now it's very difficult for you to give it up. And it damages your organs and your health. And your health deteriorate. And you know that, but because of the habit, very difficult to give it up. In this single life, you can experience that for a couple of years. But the, from the beginning list of a time, our negative habitual tendency is there. Therefore, our Lord Buddha says, you need to train thoroughly. And giving three trainings, the training of morality, 
the training of concentrative meditation and the training of wisdom. So beautiful methods. These are nothing to do with the religion at all. Nothing. Religion is a totally separate the, the reality. The religion is just a method. According to the Buddhism, what they consider the religion, the religion is just a temporary method. It helps you to become a good person. That's it. And the Buddha does not want you to become a very strong religious person. Buddha wants you to become a person who believes in reality. And the Buddha wants you to open up your mind. And the Buddha wants you to wake up your mind fully. And the Buddha wants you to trust yourself. Because he sees you have a, a tremendous potential. That potential is a hidden. If you don't walk with it, even Buddha can't help you to reveal, to discover it at all. Yes? So therefore, as a person who does not have a religious background, it's sometimes rather easier to train the mind than the person who believes a religion. Sometimes it's very difficult to walk with the religious people, very complicated. Most difficult. To me, yes, very difficult. I experienced that. When I talk to someone who is free thinker, very easy to walk with him or her. So easy. But if you are religious, particularly if you are Buddhist, much more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have to be very honest with you. I'm Buddhist, but still. <laughs> so, you see, I ever talked to you yesterday also in the, in the pendling, said that I'm not a teacher. I'm here reviewing the speech of the, those great Mah, the Mahapandits, the scholars of great things. They are so beautiful person like Chandrakirti, Shantideva, Shantarakshita, Dharmakirti. Each and every day I was is so beautiful. People say these are philosophy. To me it's not philosophy. Philosophy is based on the value of your belief. There is something, there are a lot of creativities from your own theory to me. To me, their teaching is practical. If you pay attention, that's it. If you don't pay attention, this is a complicated philosophy. Yes. Philosophy is beyond your human imagination. Inner philosophy, that we are looking for. Not the external philosophy. The philosophy that is you learn from the school, from the lesson, is very superficial. Cannot change your mental attitude at all. In, in, instead of that, sometimes if you misuse or if you not careful, these philosophy will help you to increase your ego. So, I don't want to touch the bun, the fire, it burns my finger. So instead of that, I sometimes keep distance from the fire. <clears throat> you, should, you should see your ability, if you are ready, open up a mind, the fully awaken your mind, okay, then you can touch the philosophy. But to me, inner philosophy is the most important. That is something that you can change your mental attitude by awakening your mind. No need logic at all. This is very common. That's why I say you must listen attentively. You must examine very attentively. You must think very attentively. Our problem is lack of attention. Books does not books don't work with you at all. You buy from the bookshop, book titles are so beautiful. They will even tell you you read this book tomorrow you'll be enlightened. Don't dream, please. The books are the best deceiver. The books are the best cheater. A book is just 
method and to tell you something different. If you experience, your experiential understanding tells you a different story than the book that you have read. Yes. And the book tells you the information very briefly. And the book writers are also smart. They don't tell you everything. They want you to come to see him. Because the big book gives you just a curiosity, make you so curious, which means you need to go back to see him, the author itself. So don't rely on the books, and don't rely on the theory, and don't rely on too much intellectual way of understanding. So therefore, I always tell the friends to watch inward your mind. It's so simple, like the teaching given by Shantideva. Shantideva is not really necessarily to be a Buddhist, a Buddhist master. He is, he is very, very mastered for everything. He is the best economist, actually. And uh, he, he knows the laws and the regulations, and uh, he knows the, the, how to develop the humanity. And he gives us the principle of the happiness. And he tells us how to make a joyful myself. And he tells us how to make joyful the lives of others. The without religion flavor. Without a religious flavor. Some, they are so scared of religion. They don't want to touch religion. And some, they're too much religious, so very imbalanced, you see. So the teachings of those great masters in India, it really didn't touch the religion at all. It's the system of value. The value that is correction of your attitude. And you try to search, find out who you are. And sometimes you don't know who am I. You know? Until you fully awake in the mind, you would not know who you are. I want to know who am I actually. Right? So based on this, then I develop my noble qualities. Until you don't find yourself, you can't develop the innermost qualities. That's why the system the of the the, the value of the system is very much on the principle of awareness and aware yourself and aware of your mental attitude. So living joyful, everybody can do it. Everybody can do it. It's rather very simple and very easy. It's not complicated at all. Then, the next is peaceful dying. Then, if you live joyfully, then don't need to worry about peaceful dying. No, you don't need to worry. You may complicate dying because the life is being complicated then you will die in a complicated way. So the peaceful, the peacefulness is also the quality of the mind, isn't it? The quality of the life is not the quality of the death. The death is part of your life. It's nothing special at all. <clears throat> it's just part of your life. Everybody is scared of death. <clears throat> In Asia, 80% they enter in Buddhism. Why? Because they're scared of death. Yes, that I can make sure. Yes, very sure. And when they come to the master, go to master, their first request is, please help me when I die. That's it. They never ask, can you give me teaching? Never. Never. In the past, if somebody come to me with the scarf and an envelope, sure, they will ask you death. 
somebody is dying, somebody is dying, I'm going to die soon, so please help me. But they never ask me, please grant you blessing that we live joyfully. Yes. So you see, the death is nothing special. Death is nothing special. If you awaken your mind so you can understand and you can sense that death is just a part of your life. It's nothing special. As Bilarepa says, the death is natural, the breath is natural. If breath is there, and then the death is there. Right? So this is what we call the cyclic existence. Cycling. The birth, the death, and the birth, and the death. This is cyclic. It's nothing special. Until you fully awaken your mind, these two notions always are within you. Never let you be free. Unless you're purposely born in this samsara to help all sentient beings, like a great bodhisattvas, okay, they have a power to, uh, to choose the, uh, the realm. Okay, now I'm going to this realm, I'm going to that realm. So they have a full of a power because of the fully realized their true nature. And they have empowered, magnetized, or whatsoever. They have subjugate, they subjugate their, the evil, the mental attitude. Yeah? And they have magnetized the power. They have pacified their mind. All activities, they have been achieved. So no problem to choose the realm. It's so simple. Like you buy the ticket to go into any other European countries. It's up to you. But the problem is, sometimes you can find it quite funny that uh, because uh, we celebrate the birthday, so that happy birthday to you. But actually, this is the cause of death, you know? <laughs> Yeah, if you think carefully, it's rather scary. The birth is more scary than the death. So for this, to me, actually, I would say happy death day to you. <laughs> because you are coming back again anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds strange, actually. It's, uh, because if I say this, then people will criticize you. But I uh, wish it's true. But actually, the death and the birth. As Milarepa says, he's a yogi, he's a highly realized being. And he said, I'm not a religious person, but I'm the person who is able to, uh, to catch my own reality. So he's a not religious person at all. A great yogis are not religious person at all. They are the person who have been achieved their own true nature and their own reality. Because they have a full of wisdom. And they have never caught up by all these mental distractions at all. They can take it everything easily and lightly because no longer disturbances are there. So they are fully freed and they are completely free. In this matter, you can see the death, the birth, same value. Same value. Right? Same value. And if you think carefully, yes, it's true, the death, the birth is rather more scary than the birth, the death. Because of the birth, than the death. So, if you live your life joyfully, happily, and you understand the, the characteristic of the birth and the death, then the death does not cause you unhappiness. And the death does not bring you be restless. Therefore, those great yogis in the past, when they die, they laugh, they make a joke, they make a fun, they sing the song, they sing the doha, then they passed away. So, so you see, what does this mean? So this shows us, this shows us you see, the death and the birth is totally equal. So we don't need to worry about the, the peaceful dying. We need to worry the joyful living. This is more important. This is not the time for us to worry about the peaceful dying. If you wish to die peacefully, you must prepare be ahead, which is the joyful living. And the joy, the word itself, 
to me is not that the joy by the facilities, the external facilities. To me, the joy that is fundamentally arise from the wisdom. If overwhelmed, the joy causes also another problem. The joy that provide by attachment, the joy that provided by disturbing emotion, the joy that the provide by afflictive emotion, attachment, the desire, this joy will not bring you ultimate happiness at all. So the joy to me here, in the sense of uh, common, it is very much like something satisfaction. And the contained, the feeling of a contained. If you feel contained, and if you feel satisfied with what you are having, then you can live the joyfully, truly. And another joyful life can be provided by being so compassionate. The what this dissatisfaction and this the miserable life is because of being so selfish. And I myself think of myself too much individualistic. I'm concerning for myself. I'm consider myself. And I never care for others. Never think of others. You are too much tied strongly within. You are too much attached to the within. Then this gives you the tight in the samsara that never let you be free. So there you cannot live joyfully. In order to be joyful in your life, you should feel contained with anything that you have. You understand others, and you understand the matters, and you understand any circumstances. And if you being so big heart, big hearted, and a full open open up your mind, then the joyful is there. The joyfulness is there. What makes you a miserable life? The opposite of the joyfulness is the miserable, unhappiness. Because of this is something wrong, which is that you never feel contained, and you want more and more and more and more, and because of the dissatisfaction, you can understand. Then all other disturbing emotion arises. Anger arises from the dissatisfaction. Attachment arises from the dissatisfaction. The jealousy arises from the dissatisfaction. All these unwanted sensation. The negative sensations are arise from the dissatisfaction. If you examine thoroughly, if you check thoroughly, carefully, you can sense it. You can understand it. This is very obvious in our daily life. So, if you are really anxious for living joyful or the the joyful life, then. Only matter that can help you to be joyful is to be contained. To be contained, and the compassion, the loving kindness. If you value these noble qualities, if you give this idea to others, make them understand these noble qualities and the value of these, and the, this is the great contribution. That this way only you can make this world is so beautiful. Why this world is ugly? Because they're full of misunderstanding each other. They're full of uh, aggressive action. They're full of uh, their depression and full of uh, negative mental attitude, physically, verbally, mentally. Everything is a negative. Most of the time, I can tell, whether you are in the social. In the society, or you are being alone, or in the family, all this chaotic situation brings up by misconduct and a misbehavior, lack of morality. So, therefore, like our Lord Buddha gives teachings like Four Noble Truths, is very much on moral grounds, 
And he concerns the first, first one is the morality. And the morality is the very important. And the morality is the one who makes you satisfied. And it gives you satisfaction. It gives you contained your life. And you are so happy with your life. And uh, you are no, no longer wanting or, or willing or looking for something else much greater than what you are having. You are totally contained with whatever you are having right now. So, joyfulness or happiness or blissfulness whatsoever are all come from our within, from within, not from outside. Never. It's all from our own mind, from within. That we have to know. The money, the external factors, they give you some part of joy, but this joy is not ultimate at all. The relative, it changes instantly. Today you are happy, but tomorrow you are unhappy. This morning you are very contained, but this evening you are not contained. This morning you say, I'm okay, but afternoon you said, I'm not okay. And when you go to bed, you say, okay, I'm happy, full of a smile. Morning, when you get up, you show a long face. So all this something, so sensation, the feeling are all related to the emotion. And the emotion is very uncertain. Sometimes it is uncertain because of the cause and the condition, but sometimes because of the inner element changes. So element is very much related to the, also your mood and your emotion. Why element disturb you? Because lack of morality, lack of contentment. No? So the lack of understanding, lack of realization, lack of satisfaction. So all this also affect the inner element. So external element and the inner element is very related to each other. It's very interdependently related to each other. Yes, it is. And because of the human, this destructive mental attitude, you see, now the world itself also becoming deteriorated. The climate changes, and the tsunami, the earthquake, and the place where it's too cold in the past, now it's become a hot place. The place where hot place is now becoming a cold place, everything is moving. Now earth also sends your negative mental attitude. Too much, yes. If you practice like Kala Chakra, the detailed teachings of the Kala Chakra tells you everything. The how much relation the between the external world, internal world, and your the true nature of your mind. This tree has a special bound to each other. You cannot be independent, say that, oh, I can do everything. No, you have to depend on the elements. You have to depend on the convention. You have to depend on the relative. You have to depend on the element. You have to depend on the like, trees and the rocks and the waters and the earth. You have to depend on them. Without them, you cannot survive at all. You are not independent at all until you're fully enlightened. Then only you are ultimate independent person. When I say you're enlightened, don't expect like someone expect like in the form of an image of like a Buddha who has a crown, yeah, and a yellow robe and the holding and the the like begging bowls. You must not think like this way, because many of the people, others they think the Buddha is someone like an image that you can see in the picture, but the Buddha is the mind, the mind that is enlightened. Yeah, fully enlightened and free from all these the, uh, the, uh, the unfabrications or the contaminations. So free from all these substances, the matters and the cause and the condition, then your mind is fully enlightened. So that is the Buddha in Sanskrit. So if you have been, if you have achieved that Buddhahood, then you have gained the fully the joyful life and the joyful living. 
And you can start from now. And we are training, isn't it? We say practicing. We are practicing. So practice when you say practice, when you say meditate, when you say train your mind, when you say I'm examining, exercising or examining. All this that you are reshaping your mental attitude or reforming your mental attitude, that you try to make yourself as a better condition and a good condition, and that you can experience the changes within your life from wrong, wrong to the right, that's a correction. Like Shantideva says, not much can be done, changes. Changes are based on experience of change from the wrong to right, incorrect to the correct. So, everybody can make it. So if you could make it, then that is the, the joyful living. So joyful living based on understanding, satisfactory, being satisfactory, and understand each other, and respect others, and realize the true matter, not true nature, true matter. No? The matter that you understand the what things cause you unhappy, what things cause you happy, and you should find out the cause of all circumstances. And if you analyze this, then slowly you can adopt the knowledge of the true matter. And from there, then you can live your life joyfully. But you must not mistake the joy with this, like a sense of like external uh, the facilities like the money, the position, or the reputation, etc. These are not. These are not the joyful, not joyfulness. These are not the cause of joyfulness. These are the rather disturbances because many people misuse this. If you use it properly, then yes, certain degree they can cause a happy and a happy life, a joyful life. But many of them. The misusing because of the ego and you are misusing everything because of the ego because that always you care for yourself not others so your life become chaotic instead of joyful so that is the sense of uh, the joyful life and the joyful living and then parents, as a parent give this lesson to the children and the children should learn. The long time, long time back, when there was not much the, the Buddha Dharma flourished, even in Tibet. So that's sort of for like a, uh, the system, which is uh, not correct, is uh, existed. Let's say like a parents are given wrong idea to their own children, or say that, oh, you should fight. You should fight back. And you should kill the enemy. Yes, you have to be brave. If you be that, or you are a warrior, then we parents oppress you. So that image, then the, the tendency is uh, very firmly rooted in their heart. So become, you know, like this kind of rebels. So, then the one time you can see in the Tibet is really like a very chaotic system. That even the teachings really did not work with them. Never. So this shows us that the parents has a very heavy responsibility to give a good lesson and a good humanity, the value of the life and the joyfulness and the happiness. All this you should give like kind of a good lesson to your own children. And the children learn it, and then the slowly or gradually, then the society or community become a beautiful. Everybody has a compassion, everybody has a loving kindness, everybody has a, the, the responsibility and the responsible to others, taking care of each other, and things developed. And then the joyful living is there. So joyful living is not necessary to do with something religion or your 
the religion that is particularly like a, the Buddhism. This is very common and very simple. And a practice like a Theravada, practice of a Mahayana, also based on this, on joyful living. If you have a joyful living or joyful life, then your practice also will be successful. Yes, and then you can do meditation. The meditation will be also successful. You can do study, and this will be also successful. You do retreat, and the retreat also successful because of the power of a joyfulness. Yes, it is. And this joyful is very much like a contained, and you are always happy. And that never negative or any circumstances that disturb you, this joyful. Once this joyful is discovered, then any circumstances that are, occurs or comes to you will never disturb your joyfulness. This shows this joyfulness is the true joyfulness. It's an absolute joyfulness. The superficial joyfulness, although it is there, but circumstances changes. And it does not last there at all. What does this show? This shows this a superficial joyfulness, which is not true joyfulness. So, the peaceful dying or t peaceful death that those great masters, they can sense also when they are dying. Like we don't know when we die, but those great masters the who has a fully awakened their wisdom, they have a sense. They can sense they are, they are dying, yet they can control. And they have a joy inside the heart. And the death does not scare them. Never. Instead, the death comes to them as an object of a practice. And they are very relaxed when they are, when they are dying. I have seen a few times, there was a lady, 93 years old, that time I was 18 years old, one eight only, in Sikkim. And everybody says that time, oh, she is a great practitioner. And she seldom come out her house because she is doing meditation. But when we, she walks around, very normal. I still remember that she eats a lot of chocolate. Yes, I remember that because once I have a bagged chocolate and she gave me also because I was a child. And she kept eating this chocolate. And I still remember the shape of chocolate is like tongue, like this kind of shape has a stick there that you can eat like a, like a baby. And she does the same thing like a baby. And because that's hot, so she sit in the shadow where a lot of... Uh, fresh air there, then she eats that. Because then I want to eat. Then I said, can you give me one? Then she take out from her pocket and they give me one. But when she dies, and uh, they ask me to go to see her. I went there, she was in the bed, 93 years old, and uh, laughing and uh, smiling. And she even told me, not only me, there are a few monks, she said, oh, I'm going. She didn't say I'm dying. I'm going. <laughs> that for her, it looks like that she is going somewhere, like other country, and it seems that she will come back. Yes, that kind of a sense. Very relaxed, very happy. So, looks that she has prepared everything. There is no, like, regret or feeling insecure sensation or insecurity whatsoever. She is really contained and she is really happy. So that sort of, then after that, of course she did in the, in the form of meditation for a few weeks. So you see, this is not, not the only power of a meditation. You must not think because of the religious uh, flavor. You immediately should think, oh, yes, because of the joyfulness, the contentment. And she is always happy, always happy. So 
the happiness is the best source, the best source of the happiness and the joyfulness. And the happiness that helps you be a happy life and the next life also. Next generation, next generation, all lives it affects and then you are always happy. If you are fully happy, then any circumstances they're not going to disturb you at all because you are happy and the happiness is fully awakened and is well developed. So therefore, the death is just a part of your birth and the death is part of your life. And uh, if you understand this, then definitely you will die and peacefully and you will die joyfully and you will die happily. So, this is something to do with your the morality, and this is something to do with your wisdom, and this is something to do with your everyday attitude. Yes, and that attitude you will know, but others not. So therefore, observation is needed. If you observe your each and every single attitude, then you are very capable. You will be capable to develop such the the joyful, the living or joyful life. And the simply making prayer also not enough. And the simply making yourself as a the practitioner of whatever religion you do does not work. So only thing it works with you is when you awake your mind. And that you are capable to make yourself happy. For this you need independent. The independent is very important that you are not relying on any circumstances, any conditions. So all the teachings like Shantideva's teaching, Bodhisattva Chai Avatara, as well as like a Madhyamika teachings from the, the Chandrakirti and those great teachings from the, all the masters are all the teachings are based on how to be a joyful life. And the life is a short or long, doesn't really matter. That really doesn't matter. We cannot expect for long life at all. But the life that you have with the good quality, which is the joyfulness. So that's it. And then you must know where does it come from, this joyfulness. is from within. That's very important. That is very important. Because of the joyful that is, you can make it, not from the external factors at all. So in order to be joyful, you need all these qualities, the containment, and the, dis- and the satisfaction, and the compassion, the loving kindness, these qualities will help you to produce the joyful life, and these practices help you to sustain, abide the firmly these, the joyful life. And when you die, then this will help you to die peacefully. And they are no such separate to each other. The, everything is connected to each other. Therefore, as I said a few days back, the starting point is very important. Once your start point is uh, correct, then everything comes spontaneously, very positively. And you don't need to put extra effort into into it, and then it comes spontaneously. And when death comes you, and because you are well prepared, and it does not shake you at all, and you are happy, you are ready to accept. And you no regret, because your life is being so perfect, and you are so happy with your life, isn't it? No dissatisfaction, and you are totally happy. So dies, no problem. You, can, you accept as it is. So that is the peaceful dying. If you die peacefully, and the next is the birth. And then you also, the birth takes birth place joyfully. Yes. 
Now always, then this, this is called secular existence. Start from the joyfulness and ended up with the joyfulness and again start from the joyfulness and then ended with joyful. So you're always joyfulness. This is not the joyfulness of the mundane world. The mundane world joyfulness is not that powerful. It changes. And sometimes, in fact, the, these mundane world the happiness or joyfulness the, makes you more restless. And it does not stay with you always. Seemingly, it's joyfulness. Seemingly, this are happiness, but it changes because the characteristic itself is not the joyful. The quality is not the joyfulness. So seemingly, it seems the joyfulness, yet it is never apart from the sorrow, from the suffering, from the pain. So therefore, this mundane joyfulness causes or turns into the pain and the suffering. But the excellent joyfulness, the true joyfulness, once you are discovered, then this does not change at all. So any condition or circumstances or factors cannot change this joyfulness. It is always there. And in fact, it becomes a greater and a greater, greater. So if you do more practice, like compassion, loving kindness, bodhicitta, if you expand the power of your mind, then this will become also a supporter. The supporter to make a greater your the joyfulness. So that is the the brief, you know, what do you call, the introduction of uh, joyfulness, what joyful living and uh, peaceful dying. But uh, I can't tell much because uh, I'm not achieved these two qualities. So lack of experience, I can't tell much. But what I have shared with you is from my understanding, superficial understanding. But it's very, very good. So therefore, I did share with you. So. Please carry it on. Yeah? Carry it on. Regardless whether you are Buddhist or you are Christian or you are free thinker, doesn't matter. Principally, we are all connected to each other because we all want a happy anyway. And we are all looking for happiness and a joyfulness. In this sense, no separation. As a human or as a sentient being, we are all same principle for aim, for target, for, for longing, for desire. We are all the same that we are looking for joyfulness, right? So in this perspective, we are all linked to each other. So in this matter, we should share to each other. Whatever you have a good method, you should share with others. This is our contribution. So contribution is that you're giving contribution to others to make them more happy and more joyful. That is our responsibility. Not necessary to be a bodhicitta. That is something title. Sometimes the, the title of the bodhicitta makes you more arrogant. Yes, sometimes not so good idea. So you must not think that I'm bodhicitta. You just simply think that I'm a good person and who brings a good contribution to this world the unconditionally. That's very important. Yeah? Mental attitude. Like in Buddhism, Theravada also does everything unconditionally. They help others. They bring a good contribution to others. But everything is unconditional with the good moral, with the good mental attitude. The bodhicitta is rather more like you upgrade, but you have to be, suppose, like a good good person, more good person. But sometimes this kind of, the little bit religious flavor, when you use like a term like bodhicitta, bodhisattva, it's a bit too much, actually. It doesn't sound really comfortable, because if you make a mistake, then you fall down from the level of a bodhicitta to the ground, which is not so good. If you think, if you consider yourself as a simple person who is doing good heart, good practice, in order to help others as much as I can. So from there you start. So therefore Kadamba teachings always say low profile. 
Very important. Keeping low profile helps you to bring down your ego, bring down your pride, bring down your all this negative mental attitude. Because of keep people keep press you, you are so nice, you are so professional, you are so great, then sometimes this cause you the pride arising, which is the greatest obstacle to your practice. Unnecessary. Unnecessary. So those great Kadampa masters are always inside the cave. They don't want to come out. But inside the cave, they do great practice. The practice like compassion, love and kindness. The tremendous benefit they can give, the tremendous contribution they are given, invisibly. Yes. So that is the low profile. Why low profile? Because you are not really fully upgrade your 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 quality. Like a Buddha, okay. Then he manifests. And manifests everywhere. Then he help in different forms. Sometimes he manifests in the form of animal, sometimes all kinds of uncertain form that he manifested because he knows how to benefit. So he is totally free from all these negative uh, circumstances. So until that, as we are practitioner, I'm not talking about a Buddhist, but as a, a good person, as a practitioner, practice of compassion, loving kindness, and alt- altruistic um, mental attitude, then one should keep low profile. Yes. Otherwise, Gampopa says, if you are not careful, even the Dharma leads you to the wrong direction. Because of Dharma, then you go to wrong direction. That's the most dangerous. So Dharma means correction. We need to correct, isn't it? Even a family or in the society, if you really want to make everything beautiful, then you need a correction. Someone correct you, and you correct someone, and accept this, and accept our own fault and mistake, then we'll work cooperatively, understanding each other, then you can make a beautiful society or beautiful social whatsoever. So same thing in the in the in the human form, human society. Understanding is very important. Instead of for looking for others, looking others, we should look ourselves. Examine others, we should examine ourselves. This is what we call correction. Yeah? Nobody is perfect until fully enlightened. Yeah? This is not a matter. But everyday life as a, we need to practice like correction. So this will be able to bring the value of the life, the how the joyfulness is. Then you can sense. Now we talk joyfulness, but there's no sensation of joyfulness inside the heart. Yeah? Because of this, the dissatisfaction, extra, all these obstacles. So we need to examine the quality of the the joyfulness and the quality of the peacefulness. What does it mean we should really experience it so deeply to mingle it within our heart, with our life, make inseparable the joyfulness and your life, the peaceful and your death. You can make a mingle inseparable. If you are able to do that, then you can experience Till now, because we haven't practiced done yet, profoundly. So therefore we can raise up this subject, peacefulness, joyfulness, but there is no experience. What is the actual, ex- actual experience of the peacefulness, actual experience of the joyfulness? Still lacking this knowledge. This is very profound knowledge, very profound knowledge. Everybody could say this, Everybody can say this very easily, but it is very difficult to to make it visible, to make it live to myself and to other. Very difficult. So each and every person, if they do, then you will able to bring a great contribution to this world, and this something like a the disasters, the negative, uh, in the what do you call the coincidences, might reduce. 
will be reduced. All these negative circumstances will be reduced by improving our innermost quality, the power of innermost quality. It is, an, it is nothing to do with the meditation alone. It is something to do with the proper technique and the proper wisdom. Use properly your understanding, proper, proper use of your wisdom. Through this, then I'm sure you can experience Huh? experience of the joyfulness and the peacefulness. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then, um, this is the last uh, oracle. And the, the program here, and the thank you for organizing this by the Kamapata Center. And uh, in the future, it would be nice the more teachings so teaching is very helpful, really. But yesterday I said less teaching. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, what does it mean that you, the teaching, don't make yourself a teaching addict. And sometimes you become an addict to the teaching. There is teaching, okay, I must go. That you cannot resist and you cannot resist. So without attending this teaching, you go there, but not really attentively you listened. So this type of is what we call the teaching edit, so which is not good. So you can attend the teaching, but each and every that teaching you receive or talk or speech, whatever you receive, apply is so important. If you do that, then you can make less attend and teaching, but more increase, you can make increase more practice. And then in one year, you can make a great change, really. Otherwise, Dharma is very far, and you are still here. Dharma is somewhere still out there. You are unable to bring Dharma within, then how do you prove that Dharma is so profound? Right? So therefore, to value the Dharma is through the practice, through the application. So therefore, the application does not mean that something like the religious perspective, it's a rather practical way. You know, that you make a change. That is, this is the principle of humanity, not only Buddhism, not only religion. This is the principle of humanity. That as long as you wish to make this world is beautiful, as long as you wish that all sentient beings be happy, the joyful and the peaceful, then through this, the development of innermost quality, that methods is given by religion. If you are not careful, then you misuse the religion. Instead of benefiting, you bring complication. Religion is proper method, but it has to associate with the understanding and the wisdom, and the proper attitude, and the proper mental attitude. If you mingle these, the good quality of the humanity, along with the religion, then bring the ultimate peace in this world. I'm very sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So nam di tamji sikwani tomne ni be ranam pamji jega na je bala chuba sibe tsolen rowa rowa show. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>